This time on Partners, it's Feeding America. From the Food Project, helping to feed residents in inner city Boston, to scientists on a quest to understand a dangerous fungus that threatens our food safety, Some of the light is and researchers the pushing the limits of technology to make our farms more productive and profitable. Land-grant universities and others are facing the challenge of feeding the country. Welcome to Partners. In the next half hour, we'll travel the nation and see breakthrough work in research, education, and extension. That's what CSR EES is all about, helping universities generate valuable knowledge for those who need it, and educating our next generation of Americans. And now, it's time for Partners. In the fall of 2006, somewhere in America, the 300 millionth resident was born, and the job of feeding a hungry nation presses on. The United States has a long tradition of being an abundant land. Fresh, wholesome, and safe food is something most of us take for granted. Our country has been so successful at the business of agriculture that it plays a major role in international markets around the world. But what appears for many to be an effortless endeavor is in fact a complex process. Behind the bountiful rows of groceries hide the efforts of farmers, researchers, educators, and countless others who work in a concerted effort to bring healthy, dependable food to the dinner table. In the next half hour, you will witness just a few of these endeavors involved in the making of food. They may be unknown to many, but their vital contribution is part of the amazing mosaic of agriculture, one that fuels our nation every day. And now, Partners Video Magazine presents Feeding America. It is September 2004. Ivan, the largest hurricane of the year, is en route to deliver an unwanted visitor from south of our border. We had identified Ivan as one that had high potential to move spores directly from South America into North America. Scott Isard is Penn State University's professor of aerobiology, the study of how organisms and biological particles are dispersed through air. For two years before Hurricane Ivan, Scott had followed the spread of a plant disease new to South America, Asian soybean rust. This fungus destroys valuable soybean crops, but up to 2004, it had never entered the continental United States. He and others developed a computer model that could predict if the disease would enter America if carried by a storm like Ivan. Scott's model was designed to help us understand when and where it would come. Well, there were a number of things going on simultaneously. We were, we were preparing. The states were getting their state plans ready of how they were going to respond when they found it. Also, we, there was quite a bit of training going on for the specialists in the field who might be the first ones to find it. They had to know what it looked like, how to search for it. Scott said to me it was a lucky forecast, but I don't think it was lucky. I think it was brilliant. The brilliance of proactive planning paid off again. After Hurricane Ivan hit the U.S. Gulf Coast, Ray Schneider, a plant pathologist from the LSU Ag Center, found the first known case of Asian soybean rust in the United States. Ray was part of the training. He was the first to find it in Louisiana. It was definitely red alert. We knew, we'd been planning for a year or two, we knew that it was likely to arrive. Trained as a first detector through CSR EES biosecurity funding, Ray knew immediately what to do. He visually identified the disease as soybean rust at this experimental plot near Baton Rouge. He took samples and digital stills of the fungus for others to verify his finding. Then he contacted his colleague, Clayton Ollier, who had recently developed Louisiana's Rust Detection Action Plan. 
Clayton Oye in Louisiana. I really need you to call me back. We may have something here that all of you would like to see. I believe that we have soybean rust. I never thought I'd be able to say that, but it looks like we do. A sample will be leaving here today. We talked quite a bit with, with Ray Schneider and Clayton Holly. They, they sent digital images so that we could look at what they had been looking at. The day we've dreaded was here. As planned, the first detectors immediately sent samples to the United States Department of Agriculture's Systematic Botany and Mycology Lab in Beltsville, Maryland. And that started a flurry of activity. Mary Palm works here. She is our country's national mycologist, one who studies fungi that cause plant disease. Pieces of the suspected rust sample were shaved off for closer viewing under a high-powered microscope. All indications were that Ray Schneider's sample was indeed infected with Asian soybean rust. Next, the sample was sent to another USDA APHIS facility in Beltsville, the National Plant Germplasm and Biotechnology Laboratory. Here the fungus was analyzed at the molecular level. DNA was extracted. Samples were put into a real-time cycler for further testing. Miles away, Mary Palm awaited the results. We did confirm by real-time PCR the presence of... The second lab confirmed Mary's findings. Asian soybean rust had reached America's shores for the first time in history. This morning, it is my duty to announce to you that we have confirmed a detection of soybean rust a fungal disease of soybeans from two plots associated with a Louisiana State Research Farm near Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'd like to there were eight more finds right in a row, and the incredible thing was that it was a perfect perimeter of where Ivan had come in. It was just an outline of where that hurricane had impacted. Hi, Kitty. This is Ed. I'm here with uh, Steve Munch and David Wright. We're calling to talk with you about... Ed uh, Reddy and his colleagues from the United Soybean and, uh, Board in St. Louis had great concern that the Asian soybean rust brought in by Hurricane Ivan would survive the winter. If it did, the rust invasion could seriously threaten the 2005 soybean crop. They didn't ask. They were very, very polite gentlemen, but they told us they wanted a real-time tracking system. They wanted to be able to have a tool ready for growers in the 05 season. The concern was real. Soybeans are a major crop for the United States. Annual harvests average around $15 billion. By having a computer tracking system, soybean farmers would be able to make informed decisions on whether or not to spray for the rust disease. CSREES funded Scott Isard and others to build the rust tracker. Both from a biological point of view and also from putting us in the position to be able to gear up without the, uh, the initial uh, thinking that went into that grant, it could not have happened. And so we immediately kicked up into high gear, put a lot more people, programmers, onto the operation and were ready by early spring to go into a forecast mode on a daily basis. They completed in five months what normally would take one to two years to do. Penn State joined forces with ZX, a private sector technology company, to help meet the deadline. We weren't sure how well it would work, but oh, it was fabulous, it was excellent. It, it was astonishing. <laughs> People from all over the world watched this thing. It saves a lot of money because putting on sprays is costly. It's in the hundreds of millions of dollars in savings, just in the sprays alone. And it's good for the environment because we're not putting more fungicides into the water and into the air, and it's better for us all. Soybean farmers like David Brown from Illinois have benefited greatly from the speed at which USDA responded to the rust invasion. This effective disease forecasting has introduced new ways of looking at IPM, Integrated Pest Management. It's really changing the way we do IPM. It's a paradigm shift, this using of the web and information technology 
It's the new wave of how we do this. CSR EES funds the National Plant Diagnostics Network and the National Animal Health Laboratory Network in response to America's biosecurity issues. Food. America's supply is considered among the safest in the world. Farmers now feed over 300 million Americans daily and consumers, for the most part, have little to worry about when at the grocery store. But it is the tenacious efforts of regulatory agencies and research scientists that free us from many food safety concerns. Take, for instance, the little-known Aspergillus flavus, commonly called A. flavus. Researcher Gary Payne has studied this fungus for decades. It's a microorganism, often referred to as a mole. And these fungi cannot produce food themselves as a plant can, so they have to grow on either other living organisms or decaying matter. And this is where the problem begins. A. flavus often grows on grain and nut crops during hot, dry conditions. Corn and peanuts are often the target. But so is cottonseed, a common feed for dairy cows. To complicate matters, A. flavus produces a nasty poison called aflatoxin. In high amounts, it can cause death in humans. It is also known to cause liver cancer. Government agencies regularly monitor the grains and nuts for aflatoxin, so the American public is well protected. But finding aflatoxin in commodities can cause severe economic hardship for farmers. It's regulated by the Food and Drug Administration at 20 parts per billion. So if you have corn containing 20 parts per billion, it cannot move in interstate trade. So we're interested in the safety of the product. We want to keep producers in business. Since most corn is grown for export, the producer takes a huge loss. But the toxin also affects those who raise animals. We're concerned more with the long-term effects of aflatoxin contamination. Those are the chronic effects. It causes a reduced weight gain, easy bruising, and also suppression of the immune system. So animals become much more susceptible to other diseases. To help farmers with the aflatoxin problem, Gary received funds from CSR EES to attack the problem on two fronts. We have a small project looking at compounds in corn seeds that inhibit the fungus and inhibit aflatoxin contamination and we have identified one of those compounds. We're in the process of purifying two additional compounds with the goal of taking those compounds and screening lines of corn for high levels. The other area of my research is looking at conditions that favor aflatoxin production, what genes are expressed and when they're expressed. This involves mapping the genome, all the genetic material of the fungus. For A. flavus, that means nearly 12,000 genes. It's a daunting task. In Gary's work, he's trying to understand the specific role that individual genes, how they interact with one another, what are the controlling points with the idea that these aflatoxins can lead to prevention strategies that can then be amplified and developed out in controlling aflatoxin production in, in the field. John Groupman is from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. He believes that Payne's research has global implications. Corn is one of the major export crops that the United States has. So in world trade, the aflatoxin contamination level in corn dictates the price that various buyers around the world will pay for U.S. corn. It has an enormous economic impact. But Gary Payne's work has the potential for far-reaching consequences in human health, too. In developing nations with limited food safety controls, aflatoxin is a big problem. During a 2005 outbreak in Africa, 317 people were poisoned by aflatoxin-infected corn produced in Kenya. 125 died. Payne's goal is to develop corn seed with resistance to the fungus. 
it is desperately needed in these nations. Some of the regions in East Asia, Southern Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, people can be exposed to up to 50 milligrams of aflatoxin per year, which is an extraordinarily high level. And so I think when we look at the public health equation, the interaction across the planet is such now that we can no longer afford to have areas of the world with tremendously diminished health status because that diminishes everyone. CSR EES funds food safety programs dealing with production, processing, and distribution. The goal is to ensure a wholesome and safe food supply for all Americans. Far from the farm fields of rural America, an agrarian revolution is taking place. This is the Dudley Street neighborhood of inner city Boston. Hey, you it's a diverse, populated community with a vibrant street life. It's also home to the Food Project, a community-based organization funded in part by CSR EES. The vision for the Food Project is really putting young people at the center of creating sustainable local food systems. When we started, it was 24 young people from city and suburb. We worked on two and a half acres. We grew about 24,000 pounds of food. Today, the Food Project produces a quarter of a million pounds of food annually, 10 times greater than its first harvest in 1992. It has a full-time staff of 25, offers paying jobs to hundreds of students, and receives help from nearly 2,000 volunteers. Their success is due in part to their strong connection with the local community. It was always part of the dream was that not only growing healthy food was important, but what was important was an opportunity to bring people together across race, class, and geography. We hear this from the neighbors, a sense of pride that their young people are doing something that's useful. They're working hard. A few years ago, the neighbors were, spoke to me about wanting to see more flowers on the land. That's something that we've tried to respond to. Keeping their concerns in mind has been is one of the, the issues that I, I think is prominent in urban agriculture. Danielle Andrews has been with the Food Project for five years. She understands the special challenges of food production in the city. This is our rooftop garden. It's located at the Boston Medical Center. We got involved with this garden as a result of our effort to find more land in the city to grow food on. The city is really committed to trying to bring down the price of housing and giving us land to grow food on. They see that to be in conflict with the affordable housing movement. So we are trying to be creative about where we can grow food. All of the land that we grow on in the city, with the exception of the rooftop garden, had issues with lead in the soil. The lead got there from houses that were on the land that burned down in the 60s and 70s. The land that we're currently growing on we were vacant lots that were overgrown, in many cases were dangerous, there were drugs, etc. It is in abandoned city lots like this that the Food Project staked its claim. The first step was to clear the land of abandoned cars, old tires, and toxic trash. Then the hard work followed. We knew that lead in the soil was really dangerous to be growing food, and particularly leafy greens absorb a lot of lead. So we decided to respond by bringing in clean soil. So we built up our fields about two feet above the lead contaminated soil. We're very conscious about making sure that at, uh, we do soil tests twice a year. We do um, tissue sampling of our plants to make sure that none of the lead is being absorbed by our vegetables. So every spot you see when they work it used to be a garbage spot and they clean it out and they plant it, it's been nice and clean. Joaquim Silvera, like many who live in this neighborhood, immigrated from the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of West Africa. Cape Verdeans have deep agricultural roots and often continue their tradition of having a family garden here in Boston. Joaquim has worked with the Food Project for years and values their efforts. Oh, they are my best friend. We like family. And they've been treating me for past, let's see, past five years. 
I know them in Roxbury. They bring me compost and they spread it for me. They teach me how to do some things I didn't know. But the food project contributes to the community in other significant ways. It is teaching local youth the fundamentals of food production through a thriving salsa business. All ingredients come from food project gardens. The youth here created their own salsa recipe. Initially, they distributed the product to 12 commercial outlets, but the operation became overwhelming. Since then, it's been scaled back, but four stores still carry Food Project Salsa. Students also learn culinary arts at the facility. And twice a week, throughout the growing season, it's harvest time. We'll probably be harvesting between four and 500 pounds of stuff this morning. We have a lot of things to bring in this morning. We have uh, our peppers and tomatoes and eggplants are just starting to come on in a big way, so we're going to be harvesting a lot of that. A lot of greens, a lot of summer squash. And the reality of this day and age is that most people are very far removed physically from farms and the places where our food is being produced. So urban agriculture offers this opportunity for city people to, to come out and work on our land. Hey, Joe, look. It is now 3 o'clock. The red tents at the busy intersection at Dudley Commons signal that it's market day. And the food project workers are ready to serve their customers. They come because they need a job. It's a combination of the real work of growing food, learning through workshops, etc., and then personal reflection. And the education we do is intentionally tied to what they have to know to succeed in their job. There was a young person years ago who said, you know, it was here, it was the first time when I actually could try to sort of take off the person I have to be in my neighborhood and my school and try on who I might really be underneath that. And particularly for the young people who, who may not have had the kind of support at home that they would like to, for them to nurture plants, take care of plants, they then can transfer some of that to themselves. It's very deep work that we do beyond the growing the vegetables. There is something healing about being on a piece of land that's peaceful and quiet and safe. Since 1996, CSR EES has funded nearly 250 community food projects in 46 states around the country. In the grand scheme of feeding America, tools in the field are fundamental. They make the difference between profit and loss, shortage or surplus. But today, researchers are mixing brains with brawn in the new machinery of agriculture. The future is now, and it's the beginning of the robot farm. This is the green secret sensor that was developed originally at Oklahoma State University. Researcher John Soley and his team worked with Entech Industries, a private sector firm, to create the green seeker. This smart machine reads a plant's needs and then applies precisely the amount of fertilizer or herbicide needed. We use sensors to let the plant tell us what it needs. The green seeker shines light at red and near-infrared wavelengths on the plant. That light is absorbed by the plant and some of the light is reflected back up into the sensor. The sensor measures the amount of light being reflected off the plant. We can take an applicator, drive out in the field, have the sensor look at the crop, make a determination of what the plant actually needs in the fertilizer, and then apply only that amount. This is precision agriculture at its best. The environment is spared unnecessary spraying of chemicals. The savings in fertilizer translate into cheaper food at the grocery store, and farmers benefit from lower operating costs. We estimate our farmers are seeing typically about $10 an acre savings in the amount of fertilizer applied. In fact, we have had cases where, based on our sensor, they've come to the conclusion they don't need to apply any additional fertilizer. So the savings can be very large.
Tom Denker is one Oklahoma farmer who has benefited. Working with extension agronomist Roger Gribble, Tom has used the economical handheld version of the green seeker on his wheat fields. Tom traditionally used 80 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer per acre. With the green seeker, he's found he can use only 20, a 75% decrease. It was really a great technology and a great savings. This is a perfect system for him. We minimize the pre-plant fertilizer that we put out. We're continuing to uh, educate more and more producers through our programs and demonstrations, such as what we've got with Tom. Uh, we'll continue to almost double every year the number of producers that accept that technology. John Soley wants to refine the green seeker for precision farming down to the square foot. He's found this to be the optimum target size for sensor technology because nutrient needs can change rapidly within a field. We're not one foot yet, but we have developed a machine that will work at two feet by two feet and work very well. Once the price of the new technology becomes affordable, farming by the square foot will become a reality. And the green seeker will lead the way to the farm of the future, the robot farm. On the next edition of Partners, from Hero Packs, helping military kids cope with the absence of a parent overseas, to the innovative Summer Academy in the U.S. Virgin Islands, from a Missouri 4-H program linking kids of convicts with their dads, to youth learning business skills in New Jersey's Seeds of Change market, CSR EES salutes our country's next generation. That's our children on Partners Video Magazine. For more on Feeding America and other Partners episodes, log on to this website.